So today we're going to talk about self. <laughs> we're going to talk about self. And does anyone remember, now I'm aging myself, but anyone remember when we were, when we were little, when we were younger, we would go to like a lake or we'd go to the mountains or we'd go to a duck pond or something, right? And what would we do? We would go and we'd take pictures, right? Remember the Kodak with the cube that spun around? You only got to use it like four times. Now, I told you I was going to age myself. But we love to just stare at the lake or we'd look at a waterfall or, or, you know, we'd go somewhere and we would just stare at it. And it was beautiful, right? Well, now all we want to do is to take pictures of ourselves in front of it. Wow. Think about that. That's all we want to do. It's the first thing we think of when we go to a lake, we go to a duck pond or something. The first thing we think of, I should take a picture of myself. <laughs> and in that beautiful landscape behind us, you can see just on this side and this side because our big old head is in there. <laughs> so, you know, it's, it's just normal. Our first thought is to take a picture of ourselves. Think about that. I just want you to think about that for a second. And that's society today. That's what our culture is today. So do you realize that the Bible in 2 Timothy 3, 1 and 2 says, But know this, that in the last days perilous times will come, for men will be lovers of selfies. Okay, I didn't say that. <laughs> they will be lovers of self, of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, proud. It's amazing to me that it says in the last days... The world is going to get really bad. And we know this, right? We've read the Bible. Yeah. And we know this. But here's the thing. He's talking about in the church. He's talking about here in the church, people will become lovers of self. Think about that. People will come in, walk into church, thinking about themselves. Think about that. That's just amazing to me. They're going to be focused on self. Now, you know, when I was younger, and even into my counseling days, um, going to school for clinical psychology, I wanted to counsel people. I wanted to help people, veterans, because I'm a veteran, and, you know, I was in Iraq, and I've, you know, got all these things going on, and I wanted to counsel veterans, so I went to school for that. Well, we had a word when I was growing up and in counseling called narcissism. Narcissism. Let me give you one of the definitions. Selfishness, involving a sense of entitlement, a lack of empathy, a need for admiration, is characterizing a personality type. Wow. Think about that. The biggest narcissists are the ones telling others not to be that way. Yeah. Think about that. It's usually people saying, hey, you know, you need to do this, or hey, you shouldn't be doing that, but it's usually the narcissist telling other people not to do that. If you think about that. Have you ever heard the term idea thief? Yes. Okay, so what happens is they take your ideas and present them as their own. Because they want to appear smart. They want to get the admiration. They want to get the affirmation, right? Think about that. They crave admiration. That's self. That's self. They want to appear smart. Passive-aggressive, prideful, narcissist. Now, that's a mouthful, right? Passive-aggressive, prideful, narcissist. You can sum that up. One word. They will never come out and say it up front. They'll go, they'll, 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 they'll make posts online. They'll, they'll say things into your face. They're like, oh, yeah, no, no, we're good. Yeah, everything's cool. You know, and then they get online or something, and they'll post things passive-aggressively. Because they think they're smarter, their idea is the best way, they're the best leadership, they're the best this, they're the best that, and it's always the people that need the healing the most. Yeah. Yeah. That's their platform. That's their platform. They will never tell you to your face, but they'll always say it somewhere else or behind your back. Now, God will never give you something that feels like it's about to explode out of your chest. I want you to bear with me on this. I've talked to many, many people that are, that, are, that are generals in the faith, and what the Lord has spoken to me himself, he said he will never give you something that's about to explode out of your chest. 
God will never push you and push you. He'll never do that. He will ask you, he will warn you, and guess what? He will urge you with a still, small voice. Every time I've heard the Lord, something very important in my life, it's always been a still, small voice. Who remembers Elijah? How'd the Lord speak to him? Many ways, but in a still, small voice. So listen, guys. Remember, the enemy is always the opposite of God. He's always the opposite. If he can't stop you from doing something, he'll get behind you and push and push and push. He wants you worn out. He wants you tired. He wants you to not rest, but he also wants you to make decisions quickly in a rush without wisdom from the Lord. That's good. Yeah. Amen. So please, hear my heart on this. As we walk through this as a team, as all of us you know, do this, make decisions, it's never rush, rush. And I can thank Mark Raftery many times for, you know, his, his, you know, he's such a godly man and such a business minded man. He's always right there with our team, you know, and our whole team just going, hey, you know, I think we should wait on that. Or if there is something we feel like we're being rushed on, God will always say, you know, hold on, hold on. And we listen for that still small voice. So that's very important. That's for somebody. I want you to, I want you to keep that. Okay. Now. It used to be what we call narcissism, like we were talking about, but today it's called Facebook. <laughs> Facebook. It has become normal to set up a page about ourselves. Now, Rebecca and I, we share a page, and we share that page so we can make people laugh. I don't know if you've ever read our page. I got the funny ones. She's got the, you know, the so-so ones. But, yeah, anyway, but... And our church has a Facebook page so we can, you know, let people know what we're doing. But people have personal Facebook pages that they'll set up because they are so wounded. They're so damaged that they want the world to look at them. And we're doing them a disservice because when they, they, they you know, you, you got a new haircut. You got a new hair color. You've been exercising. You know, you got this, you've got that. And please hear my heart on this. You want people to say, oh, so beautiful. You're so gorgeous. That is absolutely amazing. Listen, guys, instead of getting with God for the damage and the hurt in your life, you're going to the public. You need, a, you need affirmation so bad, you're going to share every aspect of your face or, or, or whatever with everyone. This is the public. And then when you get a bad comment, someone goes, yeah, that's horrible or whatever. Then you're, then you're d just devastated. Yeah. You're not going to your maker and going, Lord, I need to get right. Something's not right in me. I need, I need, I need healing on this. Amen. You're putting your, you're hanging yourself out in public. And then we come on and we, we go, oh, you're gorgeous. Oh, you, you're doing them a disservice. That's right. That's true. Just go to them and say, hey, listen, I'm going to invite you to church. Why don't you come to church? And, and please hear my heart. I know you're trying to help people. I know you're trying to bless people. I know you're trying to make them feel better, but are we supposed to live by our emotions? No, no. And so what we're doing is we're trying to make someone feel what they can't feel, and we're trying to impart into them healing that we can't do. That's it takes good. God to do this. That's good word. So please understand my heart. I'm not trying to pick on anybody. We, we're all growing in this area, right? Amen. So let's take the focus off ourself. Let's, let's, let's get out of selfie mode. Everyone has a phone that gets out of selfie mode, right? I don't even know about that. But anyway, it's become normal. The Bible says in the last days it's going to creep into the church and it's going to be all about themselves. They will love themselves. I bet 90% today of the church body walks into the church thinking about, them, uh, thinking about themselves. Where am I going to sit? Who am I going to sit by? I don't want to sit by them. Think about that. I mean, let's just be honest with ourselves. I hope the speaker says something to me. I hope they sing that one song that I like. You know? I hope they don't sing that song because that song isn't Christian. That song says something bad. I don't like that song. Think, how many people have you heard say that? That's religious. 
you know, we're not going to have a perfect, you know, we, you know, there are songs we love. Absolutely. But you know what? Let's hear the heart behind the person that wrote the song. Listen, we're all in different seasons, right? Let's say someone's up here in this season and someone's right here in this season. They want to write a song to the Lord and they don't get the words exactly right. Are we going to hammer them and go, no, I'm not going to listen to that song. <laughs> Think about it. And that person now gets their feelings hurt. They get offended, which is something they need to work with the Lord on getting offended. But come on, we're supposed to be a light in a dark place. Everyone, you know, you walk in and you're focused on yourself when you walk into church. Oh, I'm going to be cold again in that church. <laughs> I'm, you come into church and your focus is on you. Some of the most miserable people I know cannot stop focusing on themselves. And you think you're going out and you're going out in public and you're ministering to people and you're, you're, you're telling everybody, oh, we had, you know, I had 80 people healed today. I had 60 people healed today. And you come into church and you're just as much a wreck as anyone else. What kind of a, what kind of a testimony is that? And I'm just saying, because I was watching a guy from China apparently doing this, and, and two, two posts later, you know, he's like, Lord, I don't know what I'm doing. I'm thinking about killing myself. And so, listen, guys. Listen, it, it, I, I love your motivation. I, I love that. But sometimes our motivation is misplaced. Yes. Let's, let's, let's get our foundation correct. And let's build on that. And let's walk with that. And then we can run later. You don't start off running. Right? right. right. And, and this is why we link arms. So we can walk together and start walking up that hill together. And help each other up the hill. And please, I, I don't want anyone to get offended by what I'm saying today. That is a trick of the enemy. Amen. But I want to do is tell you the truth. And if it convicts you, it's an area that we need to work on. And it's me. And I'm working on that. I promise you. It is not me pointing fingers. I promise you, the Lord dropped this in me, and I told him, I will always tell what you asked me to say. And that's what I'm doing. Amen. You love me still? Thank you. Yes. All right. All right. Some of the most miserable people we know cannot stop focusing on themselves. That's true. They come week after week, no matter what I say to them, no matter, no matter what I do for them, it's never enough. It's never enough. I can't please them. I'm not enough. I'll never be enough. And that's the thing I want you to understand. They'll say, I, I can give them a verse. I can give them a scripture. I can say, I've walked through this myself. And they'll always come back and say, yeah, but look how it makes me feel. Self. Yes. Self. The best thing I can do for you today, the best thing this team ministry team, our leadership team can do for you today is help you take the focus off yourself. If you could turn that, we talk about it, just turn it from here to here. If it's not about you, it's amazing what you can do for someone else. It's amazing what God has put you in a place to do if it's about someone else. It's not just about you. The secret to life, the secret to life and the secret of joy in Christ is to get out of selfie mode. That's the secret. If you can turn away from yourself long enough, you'll get this joy that just comes. It's better to give than receive. I can't even tell you like that. We were walking through some things in that area ourselves, and I've seen Darren and Patricia get some just wonderful joy out of that thing where, you know, it's just, and I can give you example after example of people in this room that are so about giving. It's just amazing. And, and you just see it on their face. It's just absolutely amazing. Now, this goes directly against the world's mindset. That's right. yes. Save everything. And what does Andrew say? Can all you get and sit on your can, whatever. But you save it, you store it, and you die. Whereas this whole time, you could have been just, just walking through life, just giving, 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 giving. giving. You know? One of the biggest complaints we got about this conference with, with amazing speakers is you're charging for us to come in. I'm like, that's, that's where your focus is? You know, what did, what did Darren just talk about? Where your treasure is, right? 
There your heart is. $45 to come see some of the best men of God in the world right now. And your focus is $45. Hmm. The best thing you can do for yourself is get over yourself. Get over yourself and stare at someone more beautiful than you. Amen. Think about that. That's what David was saying. In Psalm 27, David was saying, there is just one thing I want. One thing I want. What is that? What did he say? One thing I want is just to dwell in your house and stare. I just want to stare at you. He's talking to God. I just want to stare at your beauty. That's what he's saying. That's what David was saying. That's been completely lost in this generation. It just, it, 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 it saddens me, but we have an opportunity, like I spoke of at the conference, I said, God's done his part, we get to do our part. God needs our voice. Yes. We can't just sit here and go, I'll pray about it. I'll pray about it. Faith without works is dead. Amen. Open your mouth. Share the word. We have to be in the center of every picture. <laughs> then we wonder why we're unfulfilled. You're unfulfilled. There's, there's just an emptiness there you cannot fill. Can I be boldly honest with you guys? Watch the toes. <sighs> Affirmation is something that's bad. Have you ever heard someone say to you, okay, let's say you're wearing a new jacket or something, you know, man, you have that, I love that jacket. That's an awesome jacket. And I'm like, oh, well, thank you. And they're like, well, don't you like mine too? Yeah. Instantly. Yep. Come on. Yep. Damage, wounded, uh -huh. affirmation. On. You look so pretty. Aren't I pretty? <laughs> I mean, listen, and, and it breaks my heart because they're not seeing, they don't know who they are in Christ. Right. And they've been preached at. They've got scriptures. Now, listen, guys, we have a library of scriptures in our mind. It doesn't do us one bit of good. <laughs> You can spew verses all day long, but if you aren't walking it out and living it, it's, it's not changing you. Instead of taking the focus off ourselves, we beg for compliments. That's a problem. We need to know who we are in Christ, the way Christ sees us. You know, and, and, and listen, and once again, we're all walking through this. It's not just one, it's all of us. We all have it in, in different areas in our life. The secret to joy is taking focus off of ourselves, and you stare at God. You just stare at Him and what He's done and who He is and the amazing abundance of beauty that He has. Remember the Lord's Prayer? Do we really want earth to be like it is in heaven? I mean, think about that. Do we really want... Think about that. Revelation 5, 11 through 14. I'm just going to describe a little about what heaven's like, okay? Then I looked, and I heard the voice of many angels surrounding the throne, the living creatures and the elders, and the number of them was 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands, saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing, and every creature which is in heaven and on the earth and under the earth and such as are in the sea and all that are in them are heard saying blessing and honor and glory and power be to him who sits on the throne and to the lamb forever and ever. And the four living creatures said, amen. And the 24 elders fell down and worshiped him who lives forever and ever. Are, are people taking selfies in heaven? Are people coming up to God and saying, you know, hey, look at me, look at me, look what I did. What are they doing in heaven? They are focused on him and they are falling on their faces and saying, glory, worthy are you, worthy is the lamb. Why would we do it here? Why would we look at ourselves here? I bet you a hundred dollar bill, there are no mirrors in heaven. We will be staring at his glory, at his face and just just falling on our face as long as we can look at him. And, you know, it's just amazing. So if we want it like it is in heaven here on earth, then we need to stop looking at ourselves. Hmm. 
You know, think about it. That's the last thing I want to look at. I don't want to look at me. I want to look at him. Because, you know, as we walk through this, this effortless change, when we spend time in the, in the Lord and in the Word, and we walk together through two tough things together, the last thing we want to do is look at ourselves. And we're so miserable. We're so sad. We're so this. We're so offended. We're so angry. We're so, it's all about us. Listen, you're alive. You have an opportunity. And we go through tough seasons. Please hear my heart on this. Yes. And that's why we're together to, to walk with each other through that and to help get the focus back on what the focus should be on. Yes. That's what we're trying to teach you in this church. That will bring you joy in life. That's right. You, when you recognize someone so much more beautiful to look at than yourself, the Bible says he dwells in unapproachable light. There are millions of angels worshiping him, staring at him. And yet many of us would rather look at our picture on a phone. It sounds silly when we break it down, right? Let's put the focus where the focus needs to be. Take your eyes off yourself. That's what we're trying to teach you at this church. Our, our, our saying here at the church is love God, love people, right? It's also... Now I've added a line, look at God, look at other people. Who does that leave out? You. Look at God, look at others. Now, I, I hope you understand that God has gifted each one of you in a wonderful way, yes. in a unique, just a, a beautiful way. He's gifted each one of you at, with at least one gift. And the reason we don't know what that gift is, the reason we're not operating in that gift is because you're not using it for the common good. A lot of people want the gift for themselves. Boy, if I operate in this gift, more people will see me. If I operate in this gift, right. I'll get noticed. Mm -hmm. If I operate in this gift, I can start my own thing. Ah. Think about that. Did God call you to wherever your walk is right now to serve? Absolutely. We're all servants, right? But if you start thinking about your own thing, I promise you this. You're not going to hear that still small, silent voice. The only way we ever heard that still small, silent voice was we died. I mean, we literally got on the floor. We got in there and said, Lord, whatever it is you want. And it wasn't, everyone says that. Oh, yeah, anything you want, Lord, we'll do it. You know, anything you want, we'll even go to Africa, and we'll live in one of those huts in Africa, uh -huh. you know. Yeah. No. When you legitimately die to yourself and say, Lord, I can't do it. I don't know what to do. I want you. I, it, I want to serve you. And boom. That was what it required. I wouldn't be here right now. Who knows? This church wouldn't be here right now because we took our, 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 our focus off of us. And please hear me, I'm not saying we have it down. I'm saying in this area, that's where we had to get rid of ourselves so he could talk, so he, we could hear him. And that's what we want for you. So let's be honest with each other. You didn't come to church today saying, God, give me that gift because I want to bless people here. <laughs> let's be honest. I mean, I'm not saying everyone, maybe, maybe some of you did, but I'm saying you typically don't say, all right, God, I'm ready for that gift so I can go to church today, and that lady I'm sitting next to, I want to bless her. It's usually not like that. Be honest. Listen, guys, whatever I say, I can't get into your heart, but I can get into your head a little bit. And it's going to have to be supernatural that I get into your head because selfish people typically don't realize they're selfish. Sure is quiet in here. <laughs> they only think about themselves. And that's the very thing that's destroying them. That selfishness is the very thing that's destroying them or keeping them from getting where the Lord has called them to go. Philippians 2 3 says, Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than himself. Do we believe the Bible? Yes. 
Is it 100% true? Yes. All the time? Yes. That's a very good verse then, right? Yeah. He's saying, do you get anything from Christ? Are you getting anything from Christ? Then esteem others above yourself. Yeah. Think about that. Don't come in here focused on self. Modern counseling, which is one reason I went the opposite way, is because they want you to focus on you. Let's go deeper. Let's go deeper in you. Let's see, you know, what your mom did to you growing up, what your mom didn't do for you growing up. What did your dad do to you growing up? Well, you got a, you know, you got a father wound there. You know, what's, you know, and that's what modern counseling wants you to do is focus more on you. Where if you come in for counseling here, I take it and I turn it around on Jesus. I say, what did Jesus do for you? Amen. What's already been done for you? You are set free. All you have to do, it's a free gift. All you have to do is receive it. People twist scriptures. They twist scriptures to turn around and focus on them. Love your neighbors as you love yourself. You know, what do they do? Well, I don't love myself yet, so I'm going to focus on me for a while. I hear it all the time. And when I fix me, then I can love, you know, that's not what Jesus was talking about. Jesus didn't come to be served. He came to serve and he gave his life as a ransom for me and for you. Jesus came to rescue me and he came to rescue me from myself. Galatians 2.20, Paul says, I've been crucified with Christ. No longer, it is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives within me. Now, I'm just talking about this, all right? The life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith of the Son of God. So I'm a changed person, right? That's a picture of baptism. It's different. Christ would not walk in that door and think about himself. Would he? He would focus on your needs, what he can do in your life. He can save you from yourself. That's what Christ would do. If we're going to be little Christ, we should be doing the same thing. You're never going to be happy as long as you're staring at yourself. That's right. So good. Imagine what an amazing church this would be if everyone came in thinking about others. No, no, no. Go ahead. You can have the close parking spot. I won't park where Rebecca always parks. No, no, I want to. <laughs> or like, no, you know, it's okay. No, no. You have the seat. You go ahead. I'll stand up. Yeah. Or I, I don't care how warm it is in here right now. <laughs> <laughs> we aren't willing to move on from ourselves. It's not comfortable. You've, you're, you're in a spot right now where you're comfortable thinking about yourself, you know, putting yourself out front. You know, and as the older we get the, in our walk with the Lord, the more mature we get, I should say, some of us really start to get it. And we start to understand, why on earth am I doing this? I don't care how, I don't look, I mean, I always tell everybody, see this white right here? This is because I saw the Lord face to face. <laughs> hey, okay. It's just a joke, anyway. <laughs> Listen, guys, we're not willing to move on from ourselves. So Hebrews 5, 12 through 14 talks about, I think by this time, you ought to be teachers. You ought to be teachers by now. You know, our six foundational principles, this is one of them. You're still drinking milk. Think about that. You know, in, it, in the very beginning, at first, you need someone to teach you the oracles of God, so that you know them, right? But then what? Then you need solid food after the milk. But, but most people in church is still on milk. They're still on milk. For everyone who lives on milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe, a child. Some of you should have been teachers by now. You're still drinking milk. You're still drinking milk. You've been going to these gatherings. You go to church weekly. You're doing all these things. The pastor's feeding you. And you know what? This is the only time today that you're going to eat all week. You're going to eat one. That's weird. 
You eat once a week. Now, if you're eating physical food, you're going to eat daily. That's right. But you'll come here to be fed. You're going to let me spoon feed you. Oh, that's good. Good word. Praise God. Good word. And you eat once, and then you wait until next Sunday. Oh, I can't wait to eat again next Sunday. You should be eating every day. Amen. Please hear my heart on this. That's good. It's the only time you eat all week long. Some of you don't even know how to pick up the Bible and read it. Now, that's milk. That's the basic oracles of God. And I understand. I've been there. I flip it like, where do I start? All right, I'll start in the beginning. Oh, wait. All right. Oh, wait. Begat? Who be anyway. You know what I mean? I'll go to Revelation. Everybody goes to Revelation at that point. Where does it say 666? You know? And that's, that's milk. That's where we get to teach you. Listen, start in John. John, oh, look at my, that love. Yes. <laughs> Good stuff. But that's where we get to, but after a certain point, you have to move on from the milk. Some people go, you know what, I'd rather come here and get fed by the pastor. Absolutely. By all means, praise God. But that's Sunday. What about Monday? What about Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday? If you didn't eat regular food like that, you would be flipping out. You'd be eating donuts and whatever you had available, you'd be eating. I'm not bashing anyone for eating donuts. Remember, I was a police officer. Okay. <laughs> and, here's, and here's the thing. The pastor feeds you, and then you complain. And then you complain about it. You didn't feed me enough. Are you kidding me? People will actually say, I didn't get enough. Think about that. Self. Self. You should have been a teacher, but you're up here complaining that I didn't give you the milk bottle. You didn't get your baba. <laughs> Think about that. That is not maturity. Any way you look at it. You didn't feed me enough, Pastor. I didn't get enough from worship. Worship's really slacking. I didn't get enough from the sermon. Your sermon wasn't good enough. I didn't see enough signs and wonders. So I'm going to go to another church. Can I be honest with you? Yes. You know why you're unhappy? It's your fault. That's right. It's you. It's you. It is. And the reason I'm saying this is because I love you. It's your fault. You suck. And I'm going to explain that. Don't. You do. You come in, you suck all the life out of everyone around you. You suck all the life, you suck all the time out of everyone around you, and you're not willing to move on. It's still not enough. You start sucking from everyone around you. And here's the deal. Have you ever considered the reason you're not happy is because you suck? And you're sucking from here, you're sucking from there, you're trying to suck and fulfill yourself with what other people have. That's why I said suck, by the way. All right. <laughs> you suck the life. <laughs> you suck the life out of people. And that's the reason your marriage sucks. You're sucking the life out of that person there with you. You're trying to get fulfillment out of that person you're married to. Counseling, marital counseling, it's always about someone trying to get from the other person what you can't get. It's That's something right. you can only get from God. So good. So good. You don't have enough inside you. You guys hear my heart? Thank you. Amen. That's why David says, the Lord is my shepherd. Amen. That's good. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not suck. I don't want from other people. Yes. See what I'm saying? Yes. Put it in perspective. <laughs> Other people are never going to give you the life you expect. That's right. That's true. Other people cannot feel that. That's right. Only God can do that. Some of you suck as parents. And because you suck as parents, because you're so empty, you try to you have to get what you need from your kids. And you're sucking from your kids. 
And then when your kids leave and are gone, then you're miserable. Guess what? Then you've got to go find another place to suck something from somebody. Yeah. And you know that 80% of marriage failures are because when the children leave home, they go look for another person. Because their husband, their spouse has not given them what they need. So they start going online and they start looking for other people and they start sucking from them. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Yeah. Because they're looking in the wrong places. They need to be looking at God. Amen. Yes. Some of you suck as children. You haven't found the life with God that you need, so you start sucking from your parents. And you want your parents to do everything for you. Grown, grown kids, can I come live at home? Grown kids going, hey, can you buy me a car? Grown, they're, they're adults now, Say and they're it. still trying to suck from Say you. It. Say it, amen. Lord. Mm -hmm. We're empty people, and we start trying to leech from other people what they have. That's what causes divorce. That's what causes broken families. Then everyone who's broken, guess what? They come walking in the front door of the church, and they come in here focused on themselves and going, I need this, I need that. That's what causes a church to suck. Rather than a church that's overflowing with life. So where do we start? We start with self. Stop taking pictures of ourselves. My marriage is awesome. I love my wife. She loves me, right? Okay. We won't even say poop. All right. But listen, guys, this is important. We, we, I love my wife. She loves me. But we don't need each other to fulfill each other. You hear what I'm saying? We need each other, but we don't need each other to fulfill each other. I don't need from her. I have everything I need. There's no one I'd rather be with, but I don't need from her. I'm overflowing with the creator of the universe. Just filling me up, just overflowing. And you preach and you teach from the overflow. And you love on people from the overflow. He fills me up. He fills her up. So we're both completely filled and we're with each other and we don't need that from each other. Do you understand what I'm saying? If you have that where he is the third cord in this relationship, she's focused on him. I'm focused on him. And together we grow together closer than horseradish. Stronger than horseradish. Horseradish is strong. He is my shepherd. So... I don't want. Yeah, that's good. So get out of selfie mode. Just get alone with him. Just get alone with him. Spend time with him. And think about, look up all the passages about God. And you're going to just stop and you're going to go, you know what? You are absolutely amazing. Mm -hmm. What he's done, what he's gone, you know, all these things he's set in place, the way that he has set us up to succeed. He's amazing. Amen. Right? You have a hundred million angels bowing down to you, and he died for me. Think about that. If you get that, you get it. If you don't, you're in the process. We have a relationship, and I'm so full of him. Listen, I don't come in here to teach and preach to you dry. I'm completely soaked, overwhelming. I don't go to my wife dry. I don't go to my kids dry. I go... I go there overflowing, and that's the way you have to understand and walk this thing out. I'm, I'm overflowing because I'm staring at him. I'm not staring at myself. Think about the, uh, the lie that the devil's been using since the beginning. Remember in the garden? Think about that. I want you to, what did he say to Eve? He said, that fruit looks good. I'm paraphrasing, obviously. <laughs> He says, that fruit looks good over there. Why don't you go, to, go ahead and eat it? And if you eat it, guess what? You're going to have the same knowledge of God. You don't have to be under God's command anymore. You get to be in charge. You get to make the decisions. A lot of you's in there, right? In other words, he's saying, you be you. That's what the enemy was saying. And that's what he wants you to do. He wants you to go, you do you. Take care of yourself. Don't be under God's command anymore. You be in charge. Sounds a lot like the church, doesn't it? I want you
want you to catch this, though. The one thing Satan was not saying was, was he wasn't saying, hey, look at me. Serve me. He was saying, hey, you look at you. Look what you've got. You can do this. Think about that. Hmm. Whatever you do, let's get away from that God over there who's telling you to come under his command. Think about that. Hmm. Thousands of years later, here we are again. Everyone's taking pictures of themselves. You do you. You be you. Because I feel like I should be doing this. I feel like this is important. I feel, listen guys, stop living by what you feel and live by what you know in the truth and the word of God. That's what we go by. So, Jesus says, stop looking at yourself. Come to me. You're tired. You're weary. Give it to me. Come stare at me. That's what Jesus is saying. Look at me. Think about that. Remember in Isaiah 6, Isaiah saw God in all his glory. And the angels were screaming, holy, holy, holy. Right? What's the first thing Isaiah said? He said, woe is me. I'm a man of unclean lips. Staring at God in all his glory, that's all he could think of as well. How ugly he was, how disgusting he was, how bad he was. When you see God in all his glory, suddenly you see all your imperfections. So, Jesus says, don't look at yourself. Deny yourself. Deny yourself. Deny yourself. That's huge. Two words right there. Think about that. Deny yourself. Don't stare at yourself. Pick up your cross and what? Follow. Follow me. Now, how many of you know if you're walking down a trail and you're following someone, who do you have to be watching? Yeah. The person you're following. Yeah. So if you put yourself out front, guess what? Who am I going to look at? Oh, look how awesome I am. If you're following him, you're looking at him. Your eyes are on him. If you're going to try to save your own life and show everyone else your life, guess what? You're going to lose it. You will lose your life. But if you lose your life, if you let go of yourself, you deny yourself, that's how you're going to find life. All right? That's what the church is for because there are times when we need to get that truth out there. This is going on in my life. These things are happening in my life. That's what the church is for. We get to come together. We get to apply the word to it. We get to walk with you through it. But you have to move on. You can't stay in that situation. You know, if you get, you know, the word is all about that. There's a time for this. There's a season for this. But you have to move on. If you've been in the same season for 40 years now, guess what? You're probably pretty weary, pretty burnt, pretty unfulfilled. It's time to move on. It's time to go. And it's what? You hear the Lord. You start to recognize that voice. Stop looking inward for a solution. And I know. I know sometimes it's easy. I just want to go to a service and hear a good word. That's fine. It's easier to do that sometimes, right? Because you, you, you need to be nourished. But you need to start taking that and running with it. Sometimes it's a little better. Sometimes a little easier just to come and sit and let everyone just minister to you and do all that. But listen, that is not what God has intended for you. Amen. That's not what God wants. He wants you to know Him. And get your conversation going together. He wants to be alone with you. When Beck leaves and goes somewhere, she goes, you know, even if it's just for a day. After a while, I start going, man, I wish you would come back. I start to miss her. I want her to come back. You know why? That's what you do when you love somebody. And that's right, God, you know. Lord, I, I haven't spent much time with you. I miss you. I want to talk to you. That's what you do when you love somebody. If, you're not, if you don't, if you go through your weekend, you don't miss speaking to the Lord or reading the Word or anything like that, check yourself. What's your relationship with the Lord? I know so many Christians who call themselves Christians and they don't even long for the Lord to come back. You know, now I know, we're, we're, we've got things to do until He comes back and we're trying to get, you know, we've got family members, we're trying to get, you know, just preach to them, get that salvation First, and then for the, the gift things that they have and get them out to reach other people. We know that, but I want the Lord to come back. Yes. Yes. You know, I, I love Him. In, in, in your life, He's brought you out of some things, and, and wouldn't you love Him? Yes. Yes. 
So the last thing, and I'll wrap up. I'm, I'm going. I love doing this. I love, I love feeding people. I do, and, and, and I never wanted to. And when, when the Lord came and said, hey, here's, I made you to do this, it, everything changed. And I, and I love this. I love feeding people. And, you know, Moses in the Old Testament, he goes up a mountain. And this is crazy. Well, let's see. Exodus, can you go to Exodus 19.9, please? Let's look at this. And the Lord said to Moses, Behold, I come to you in the thick cloud that the people may hear when I speak with you and believe you forever. So Moses told the words of the people to the Lord. Then the Lord said to Moses, Go to the people and consecrate, consecrate them today and tomorrow and let them wash their clothes and let them be ready for the third day. For on the third day the Lord will come down upon Mount Sinai in the sight of all people. You shall set bounds for all the people, saying, Take heed to yourselves that you do not go up to the mountain or touch its base. Whoever touches the mountain shall surely be put to death. Not a hand shall touch him, but he shall surely be stoned or shot with an arrow, whether man or beast, he shall not live. When the trumpet sounds long, they shall come near the mountain. Go on to 16, please, verse 16. Then it came to pass on the third day in the morning that they were, there were thunderings and lightnings and a thick cloud on the mountain, and the sound of the trumpet was very loud, so that all the people who were in the camp trembled. And Moses brought the people out of the camp to meet with God, and they stood at the foot of the mountain. Now Mount Sinai was completely in smoke because the Lord descended upon it in fire. Its smoke ascended like the smoke of a furnace, and the whole mountain quaked greatly. And when the blast of the trumpet sounded long and became louder and louder, Moses spoke, and God answered him by voice. Then the Lord came down upon Mount Sinai on top of the mountain, and the Lord called Moses to the top of the mountain, and Moses went up. Shelly can come up. So here's what I want you to understand. We got that, right? What a crazy scene, right? Smoke and lightning and thunderings and all that, and God says, have them ready. When you hear the trumpet, then have them come close. But... Don't go any further than this. If anyone touches this, you'll die. You will surely die. And then the Lord says, okay, Moses, come on up. Think about that. So can you imagine like if this morning, okay, if this morning I said, hey, let's go to Mount Scott and the Lord's going to come down on Mount Scott. And I want you to get close, but I don't want you to get too close. Get ready. And then the Lord's going to say, all right, Stephen, come on up the mountain. I've got something to say to you. Now, I go up and meet with God. The whole time you're down there going, oh, can't wait till he gets back. I wonder what God's going to say. God's going to have something good for us, right? Think about that. I don't mind going up the mountain. I like going up the mountain. I like spending time with God. I like when he talks. I love that. I love being in the presence of God. Is But what I realized is God has not called me to be Moses to anybody. That's not what he's called me for. Because we're in the New Testament now. And Jesus did something on the cross. And when he did, the veil tore completely in half. Right? So what that means is Everyone has access to the mountaintop. You don't have to wait at the bottom. You don't have to wait for someone to go up and get a word and come down. You get to do that right now on your own, one-on-one. -on -one. Think about that. The worst thing I can do is be your Moses. You have to establish that relationship. and You can enter his presence by the blood of Jesus. Anytime. Until you start doing this and start gazing at his beauty, you're never going to be fulfilled. You'll never find that fulfillment you're looking for. You can't, you can't just suck it out of the pastor. You can't suck it out of friends and you can't suck it out of your family. It, it's not going to work. It ne it'll never work. Matter of fact, you'll end up making them want to lose their mind a little bit. Going, why don't you know? Stop driving people crazy. Let's get with God. Then your cup will overflow. Then you'll overflow. So you won't need this or that from others because you have it. You've had it the whole time right here 
and you get to walk in. But here's the thing. If any of you can say, I've never been to the mountain. I've never been on the mountaintop. I've never sat with the Lord. Then, or even, I don't enjoy speaking with him. Here's the thing. I'm scared for you. I'm worried for you. And I'll tell you why. Because the Bible says many people who did a lot of things for Jesus in judgment, on, on that day of judgment, he's going to say, I never knew you. His words, not mine. He's going to say, I never knew you. And he's, matter of fact, he's going to say, you're the one. You didn't even make it up halfway to the top of the mountain. You were that one sucking out of people in church all the time. And you never wanted to step out and get to know me on your own. So that's what we're trying to teach you in this church is, listen, you, he has put you here with a, with a purpose on this planet. And it's not to work and retire after 30 years and get a retirement check and sit around and do nothing. That's not what this is for. You have a purpose he put you here to do. And walk it out and walk it out together with the body. And that's what we, that's what we want. Don't you want to change? Don't you want to go to the top of the mountain? And hear what God says for you? Amen. That's when you become teachers. Instead of drinking milk, you become a teacher. And please hear me on this. You, you know, if you're worrying about being a perfect teacher, saying the wrong things, that's what kept me out of what I, I was supposed to do. Because I was afraid I'd say the wrong thing, do the wrong thing. I held myself to a standard that no one could keep. And then finally, I just said, Lord, I give you me, all of me. You know me, but I'm willing and I'm listening and I'm listening to his voice.